I've been cheating by using an AI bot in order to generate images of these simple people who wouldn't usually get themselves depicted and it makes it more visually interesting. So I tell the bot, create these images in the style of Zorbaran or Caravaggio or Canaletto. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. So, uh, you get a, a free CMC fellowship, I think, if you already knew all about this particular individual. Quite often in this now fairly extended series, we have uh, dealt with <coughs> celebrities, Muslim household names, uh, starting with Imam Shamil and moving through Imam Bukhari, uh, Hazrat Uthman and so forth, with a few uh, startling detours reflecting the uh, disordered reading habits which I've acquired over many decades now. And today I'm going to be introducing you to somebody who really is hardly known at all and would not have been known at all, like 99% of our brothers and sisters in Benny Adam fading away after their grandchildren died into oblivion and into the mercy of God. Um, today's theme is going to be, well, a variety of reflections, uh, looking at the very fraught interface, the leaky iron curtain between uh, Christendom and the Islamic world in the heyday of the Ottoman Empire, basically the time of Sultan Soleiman and his immediate successors. Uh, one reason for doing this is that very often this story has been underreported. Uh, historians inevitably import their own preferences, particularly when confronted by what is probably history's greatest and most emotive binary, the Islam-West uh, standoff, now 14 centuries old and still occupying our headlines in various aberrant ways, both sides misbehaving, 9-11 on one side, Abu Ghraib on the other, it gets in the way. Uh, and it's interesting, I think, as we rewind 400 years to consider similarities and differences between the then and the now. But essentially, the, the, the main theme that I want to talk about is the underestimated story of European Islam. The standard image is Islam as an Asian religion, North African religion, mm, but Europe has always contested the viability of the idea of it being a European religion uh, as well. And many of the identity forming events and epics of European history have been precisely the struggle to exclude the possibility of an Islam indigenous to Europe. Europe, to, to very a common cliche, uh, has bloody borders. <clears throat> to the east, the story of Circassia, generally not known amongst non-Muslims, but a kind of burden on the Muslim memory. The biggest massacre in Europe in the 19th century, 85% of the Muslim population wiped out. Big for Muslims, for the West, hardly known. Uh, and then you have the sorry tale of uh, the massacres in the Balkans, the destruction of Hungarian Islam, uh, the near destruction of Bosnian Islam, even uh, in the last 30 years, and then the tragic story of the Crimea and those southern Ukrainian areas which are currently being fought over with those strangely Turkic names that all of those little villages seem to have a forgotten history. Then the story of Muslim Sicily, the story of Muslim Spain, one of the most agonistic and protracted of all of these titanic confrontations, and always the story is, yeah, the Muslim, the Saracen, the Ishmaelite doesn't belong and must be cleansed. It's a recurrent feature of European history. But those who challenged that, including really very simple illiterate folk like the one we'll be considering today, uh, complexify this, blur the iron curtain and remind us that Islam has a uh, very distinguished and protracted European <coughs> history as well. <coughs> That'll be the first thought, challenging that stereotype. And the second will be the idea of what it means to be a hero if you're kind of a humble person from the margins, excluded, illiterate, never went to school, 
got jobs where you could. Normally the kind of people who, on whose laboring backs the rest of civilization is built, but who usually don't get a look in at all in the history books. Um, and I'll also be talking about the way in which Western Christendom institutionalized the struggle to cleanse its lands of the Saracenic, but also the Jewish presence, uh, which was the Inquisition. So much of today's talk will be rather grim data about the Inquisition, which is why perhaps underestimating the extent to which uh, children surf broadly nowadays, I suggested that smaller children should not attend this in many ways traumatic uh, narrative. Now, when we think of the Inquisition, we think of the Spanish Inquisition. It's almost kind of the same thing. But there are other Inquisitions with their own hierarchies established by different popes using the same kind of methods of documentation, arrest, interrogation, sentencing. It was the same thing directed by the Pope himself. The Holy Office conceived as a, as a sacred ritual, as we'll see. But there was a Portuguese Inquisition. Uh, there were Inquisitions further east for Goa and those places that were being progressively Catholicized. Uh, wherever there was a need to ensure religious conformity and compliance and to investigate and to scrape away at areas of society that weren't fully subscribing to the creed of the church, there was this very formidable institution. The pre-modern world's uh, most international and abiding uh, organization and something uh, uh, which Muslims, as in many cases, not always, its chief victims and suspects need to be aware of. But the Spanish Inquisition is the first one, it's the famous one. It's the attempt of Spanish Catholicism to effect a spiritual as well as a military conquest of the former Muslim lands of the southern three quarters of Spain. Some of you may already have heard uh, Juan Perez's two sonnets in praise of the Holy One, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, which went up on the Mishkat Media website a couple of weeks ago. A very interesting reminder of the incredible persistence of Islam in a city like Toledo in his day, more than five centuries after uh, the Reconquista, the Reconquest had taken the city. Nonetheless, Muslims... Um, maintaining a toehold in that city, which of course for centuries was the capital of Spain. He had to flee, he wrote these poems in Tunis, and many people in North Africa, not just Morocco, Algeria, uh, Libya and so forth, will proudly tell you uh, that they are actually Andalusian exiles. It's an ongoing diaspora. So this is the famous image, the first big painting that we have of the uh, Spanish Inquisition. This is by uh, Alfonso Berroguete, Berroguete the Elder, it's in the Prado in uh, <coughs> Madrid. Uh, when you see it there, uh, you tend to forget that it's actually a religious image and it was designed to be an altarpiece in a major church, I forget which one, so that while you were praying and at receiving the Eucharist, you would be inspired by this image of this is St. Dominic presiding over the trial and the burning of two, I guess, Albigensian or Cathar heretics. Um, and this became a kind of tableau and many of the kind of hierarchical, sacral images um, generated during this time uh, continue uh, and intensify as Spain in particular tries to cement its identity as a complete uniform, 100% Catholic communicant society with any hint of Jewish or Muslim or Protestant influence being uh, strictly regulated and suffocated. Basically, the purpose of the Inquisition was not primarily to deal with people who were born Muslims and had never been baptized, but to deal with people who were practicing unofficial forms of religion or purely monotheistic forms of religion, Judaism and Islam, uh, while ostensibly practicing Catholicism. So in many cases, it's a story of, of, of real heroism and of courage. Here is really the great icon of the Inquisition. The patron saint of Spain is none other than uh, this individual, San Jaime Matamoros, St. James, the Muslim killer, Matamoros means kill the Muslims, or the Muslim killer, the patron saint of Spain. 
a couple of years ago, I went into the, uh, uh, the Church of the Spanish Armed Forces in Madrid. And yeah, they have one of these that still inspires them. And as you can see from this, this is from Segovia Cathedral. It's a very racialized image, usually the Moor who is cowering beneath the triumphant hooves of the white horse ridden by St. James, supposedly Christ's apostle who miraculously appears to lead the Christians to crusaders to victory against the evil Saracens. It's always a racialized image. And many theorists of West racism in the West trace one of the key tributaries of Western racism back to the racializing of religious dif difference at the time of uh, the, the Western Crusade, the Crusade in Portugal, the Crusade of uh, the Western Mediterranean. And there are thousands of these images all over churches in Spain. If you go to the capital of this cult, which is uh, Santiago de Compostela, Western Europe's main pilgrimage road leads to Santiago de Compostela. It's the town which is supposedly the town of St. James, the Muslim killer. <coughs> There's one of these things. <laughs> and if you can <coughs> scroll around, you can find images of how the slightly embarrassed modernist clergy are dealing with this emblem of absolute xenophobia, racist as well as triumphantly Christian. And the latest thing that they've done is that the lower part of it, which has the kind of suffering, cringing, black-skinned Muslim, <coughs> is covered in flowers now. <laughs> so they kind of screen it out, they censor it, they blank it, they cancel it. But um, he still remains Spain's patron saint and invoked by many far-right groups, um, not just in Spain, but Le Matamor um, in France is also a considerable thing. But even in the New World, once I was traveling in the mountains of New Mexico, historically part of the Spanish Empire, went into this little colonial church in the village high up in the mountains. And lo and behold, there was the cross and the wooden pews. But the retablo behind the altar is the image of St. James, the Muslim killer, <laughs> thousands of miles, perhaps, from the nearest Muslim community. It's very deeply embedded. And some modern scholarship about the way in which the Americas uh, were conquered and Christianized uh, reflects on the fact that the methods for forced Christianization of the Americas were, were an extension of <clears throat> the methods used to compel Jews, Muslims, and other heretics into the fold of the one true faith. Very often there was an assimilation of the Indios, the native populations, to the Moors. In any case, talking too much about that might take us far afield, but the Inquisition comes generally in the wake of the Reconquista, and the key date is 1212, uh, the Battle of al uqab which is north of Cordoba, when the forces of Alfonso VIII of Castile defeat the Sultan of the Muahideen and Nasser. And this is the big catastrophic battle um, that enables the Christians to occupy and cleanse the great Muslim cities of southern Spain, including Cordoba and Seville. This is after Pope Innocent III has declared a crusade specifically in in Spain. So ruling a population which was for the great part Muslim, with the Christians kind of a conquering elite, meant that uh, there were very serious problems for the Catholic Church in terms of rendering the population uh, accessible to Christian truth. <clears throat> and different solutions were proposed. This guy is really the theorist of the Spanish Inquisition. Um, the first Grand Inquisitor, Torquemada, was a Dominican monk who founds, with permission from the Pope Sixtus IV, in the year 1478, the Spanish Inquisition. And in 1492, with the capture of the last Muslim city in Spain, which had been a refuge for dissidents of various kinds and was still the center of a significant Jewish community, the first thing they did, because this is an age in which anti-Semitism is really important given the seemingly anti-Semitic statements of the <coughs> Christian Bible, uh, that 1492, one of his first edicts was the expulsion and the forced conversion of the Jews of Granada. The Jews were often the first target. <coughs> uh, <coughs> so they're expelled, 1492. That's the end of publicly visible and tolerated Judaism in Spain. They're allowed to leave. They're not allowed to take uh, gold and silver so their wealth remains behind. 
A few of the Jews convert, most of them leave, and where do they go? Of course, to the Muslim world, Darul Islam. One of the titles of the Sultan is Alam Pena, the refuge of the world. One reason for Ottoman diversity is that it accepts waves of people fleeing persecution in Europe. So this is the beginning of the Sephardic Jewish stories. Um, those who remained were called Maranos. These are people who are Jewish converts to Christianity, but are secretly still practicing Judaism. Very, very uh, persistent community. And this is one reason for the purity of blood, limpieza de sangre, laws in traditional Spain. You weren't allowed to get on a ship in Cadiz to cross to the New World unless you could prove do in, with a documentary certificate that for 10 generations you had been a Christian. And this idea of limpieza de sangre, purity of blood, became one of the ways in which they tried to limit the spread of these Semitic monotheisms in the New World. Not very successfully. They were persecuting Muslims and Jews in places like Peru, Mexico City. But that's another story. So Torquemada um, is the one who systematizes the mechanisms of the Inquisition. Uh, and during his time, the estimate is about 2,000 people received the supreme penalty, which was being burnt at the stake. Uh, so he creates a regional hierarchy, offices everywhere, the institution of meticulous documentation, which is how we know about this guy Cosantino, because they would write everything uh, during their interrogation, so that if there was an inquiry from another province that had located the same individual, they would be able to compare notes and proceed accordingly. And he writes some of the books that become fundamental for the Inquisition, particularly his Treaties Against Midianites and Ishmaelites. Ishmaelites, of course, is, is us. So you have progressively the forbidding of Islam because they're not converting. They send out Arabic-speaking priests to Granada and places to tell them about the Trinity, the blood atonement, the authority of St. Peter, etc. And it doesn't really work to their perplexity. And so in 1526, they uh, bring in a new enactment, which is to forbid the practice of Islam. And the Muslims, again, all go along to church and accept baptism, but they're practicing secretly. They have fatwas to allow that. Um, and so you have this phenomenon of these kind of covert Muslims who are going to church and reciting the creed and sending the kids to Sunday school, but at home, secretly, they would be teaching Islam to their children. And this goes on for hundreds of years. They're all called Juan and Isabella, but the church knows that that's not what they really are. So the purpose of the Inquisition is to try and, uh, as it were, kick down their doors and find out what they're really doing. So 1556, when it becomes clear to the church that these people are persisting in being Moors, Muslims, secretly while going to church and doing those things, uh, the Inquisition becomes fiercer, particularly against uh, the al faqis who are the class of Muslims who are scholars who are trying to uh, uh, maintain the tradition of Islam. Very often the landowners don't like this because the Muslims are very economically useful and still in this period they're a significant chunk of the population. Uh, there's also the fear of the phenomenon of the Elche, and Elche is a complex term, but generally used for people who convert to Islam even after the reconquest of southern Spain by the Christians. This is a particular uh, kind of neuralgic issue for the clergy, uh, and they're sought out and uh, persecuted with particular vehemence. And so the priests are now not allowed to learn Arabic <laughs> in case they get contaminated. They're not supposed to get into discussions with these people. The Inquisition would never involve itself in theological argument. It would just try and figure out what you were and rule accordingly. Uh, so the usual kind of Islamophobic uh, things that even we're seeing today in some European countries, prohibitions on Muslim halal slaughter, prohibition on the face veil and so forth, these uh, familiar things are brought in. But what to do with them? By the end of the 16th century, this is a big problem. It's kind of humiliating that you have a significant portion of the population, maybe even heaven forfend, marrying your daughter, although the racial laws often made that much more difficult, uh, and perhaps even bringing up their children to be not quite right doctrinally. And so various solutions were proposed. Um, 
some of them advocated uh, the complete mass castration of all Morisco boys at birth. This was considered by the king but regarded as problematic. Some of them said, send them off to the new world. They can all go to Colombia or somewhere and be out of our way. Um, uh, some of them uh, advocated uh, mass execution. So a certain Fray Bleda, who was a Dominican priest, did a calculation and reckoned that the entire Morisco population could be executed in a single day. And this was uh, sent to, uh, again, the royal authorities, who were kind of caught between the need to make the country governable on the one hand, and on the other hand, the, <laughs> the need to make it religiously uniform. That option was not proposed, or should they all be sent as galley slaves? Um, there were just too many of them. And also, what do you do with the women, the children, their nose are pulling? Or, so these were, were big issues. People were publishing books advocating different final solutions to the Morisco problem, because these people persisted. They even had their own little rituals. <laughs> so there was something that the Spanish called the Fada ritual. You take your baby to church. The church is anointed with holy oil and it's baptized and the bells ring. You take it home and then you recite the Fatiha and you wash off the ritual oil uh, as if nothing's ever happened. And this was known to be very recurrently practiced by the Moriscos and it was really angering the, the church. Um, let me just read to you something, hopefully that isn't too long, that will give you a sense of you know, the suffering of these people. This is a poem written by a Muslim in Granada, um, lamenting you know, the miserable situation. It's hard for us really to imagine what it was like. Yeah, so this is, um, by said Muhammad bin Muhammad bin Dawood uh, in Granada just before a rebellion by the Muslims of 1568. So he gives us you know, praise to Allah and praise of his messenger. <clears throat> Listen while I tell the story of sad Andalusia's fate. Peerless once and world renowned in all that makes a nation great. Prostrate now and compassed round by heretics with cruel force. We her sons like driven sheep or horsemen on unbridled horse. We are forced to worship with them in their Christian rites unclean to adore their painted idols, mockery of the great unseen. No one dares to make remonstrance, no one dares to speak a word. Who can tell the anguish wrought on us, the faithful of the Lord? When the bell tolls, we must gather to adore the image foul. In the church the preacher rises, harsh-voiced as a screaming owl. He the wine and pork invoketh, and the mass is wrought with wine. Falsely humble he proclaimeth that this is the Lord divine. Yet the holiest of their shavelings nothing knows of right or wrong, and they bow before their idols, shameless in the shameless throng. Then the priest ascends the altar, holding up a cake of bread, and the people strike their bosoms as the worthless mass is said. All our names are set in writing, young and old are summoned all. Every four months the official makes on all suspect his call. Each of us must show his permit or must pay his silver ur as with inkhorn, pen and paper, on he goes from door to door. Dead or living, each must pay it, young or old or rich or poor. God help him who cannot do it, pains untold he must endure. Um, in their hideous jails they throw him, every hour fresh terrors weave. From his ancient faith to tear him, as they cry to him, believe. And the poor wretch weeping wanders on from hopeless thought to thought, like a swimmer in mid-ocean by the blinding tempest caught. Long they keep him wasting, rotting in the dungeon, foul and black. Then they torture him until his limbs are broken on the rack. Then within the Plaza Hatabin, the square in Granada, the crowds assemble fast. Like unto the day of judgment, they erect a scaffold vast. If one is to be re released, they clothe him in a yellow vest, while with hideous painted devils to the flames they give the rest. Thus are we encompassed round as with a fairly, fiercely burning fire. Wrongs past bearing are heaped on us higher yet and even higher. Vainly we bend we to their mandate, Sundays, feast days, though we keep fasting, Saturdays, never safety can we reap, etc., etc. Um, there's more of it. This is in a rather old book, the Moriscos. Um, 
uh, The Secret Muslims of Spain, uh, by Henry Charles Lee, which is an old book, but he translates some of the texts in quite a uh, evocative way. So this is how this community is now trying to survive. So these various theories about how we're going to assimilate these people. Should we force them all to marry old Christians so that the children will be brought up as good Christians and the final solution is affected? Ah, but the bishop said no because uh, the Christian spouse might be tempted to become an Elche. So they really didn't know what to do. So this was, to look at a text in Lee's book again, a kind of battle between the landowners who knew that the country depended on the skills of the Muslim, particularly in irrigation, for its prosperity, and the church who wanted this religious uniformity. So one reason for the decline, it is said, of Spain in this period and subsequently is uh, listed here by Lee. The decadence of Spain was not caused merely by its loss of population in banishing Jews and Moriscos, it was that the Jews and Moriscos were economically the most valuable of its inhabitants, whose industry in great part supported the rest. The pride that was taught to regard work as unworthy of an old Christian and led the beggared Hidalgo to starve rather than to earn an honest living, the indolence that preferred beggary or robbery to labor, the fanaticism that regarded religious unity as the summum bonum to be maintained at the cost of any and all sacrifice, the impulses that consigned so many thousands to a life of celibacy, a financial system so elaborately bad that in the effort to favor the consumer it well nigh strangled production, a theocratic spirit which stifled intellectual progress, all these united in preventing Spain from filling the gap in population and productiveness left by the exp expatriation of Jews and Moors. So uh, the landowners used to say, si tienes moro, tienes oro. If you have a Moor, a Muslim working for you, you have gold, Moro, Oro. They really didn't like this uh, church persecution and the various means of removing them. Then the Moriscos are banished um, in the second decade of the 17th century, but some are still secretly practicing. Um, 1769, uh, King Carlos III was told that a secret mosque had been discovered in the city of Cartagena, and it continues. Um, but obviously, as information is lost, rituals become a bit garbled, and it becomes just a kind of family memory rather than the uh, systematic practice of the, of the sunna. So slowly, through ignorance hmm, and the exiling of the scholars and this very difficult minority situation, um, Muslim Spain is effectively extinguished. So moving on now to the actual methods of the Inquisition. <clears throat> the Inqu each village would be visited by the Inquisitor, who was a churchman and his scribe, and then they'd listen to the parish priest to find out what was going on locally, who knew the local gossip, who was really sincere in going to mass and who was uh, making fun of it. Sometimes when they saw the visit of the Inquisition, people would come forward spontaneously to confess something because they were afraid that their neighbors would denounce them, which was more dangerous. Two, confession, two accusations were regarded as being enough to arrest someone. Their names were always kept secret. So during the interrogation, you couldn't discredit the witnesses because you were never told who they were. Um, the first hearing would be to establish the identity of the accused. There was always, unlike in modern English law and in Sharia, the presumption of guilt, not innocent, but you were not told what you were suspected of. They wanted to sweat it out of you. Uh, so there was a period of grace in the jail in which you could voluntarily confess that you'd had the wrong idea about the Trinity or whatever it was. And if you confess spontaneously, then the treatment would be relatively lenient. Um, if you didn't confess, and you didn't denounce others, you didn't cooperate, your food would be slowly reduced, you'd be chained up. And then if it still wasn't working, the priest would come and describe the torture to the suspect. And then he would show the suspect the instruments of the torture. He'd be taken to the torture chamber and you know, get a sense of what uh, was going to happen. And then, because the priests themselves wouldn't engage in the torture, they'd bring in uh, professional torturers. <coughs> and 
Much of this seems quite familiar, a kind of Guantanamo or black site scenario where you don't know who the accuser is, you don't know what you're being accused of, you're kind of in the dark and that's part of the psychological pressure. As at Guantanamo, there isn't a trial, only a series of interrogations after which you go back to your cell. Uh, there was no need to specify the crimes. So quite often people under torture would confess not knowing what the crimes, crimes were. And this was often an effective way of getting out of people something that was really going on, although, again, as at Guantanamo and with modern American uh, torture systems, you know that sometimes under extreme pressure, people will confess to anything. Um, it's a very uh, unreliable method. Uh, so here you have the famous painting by Goya, the early 19th century dark Spanish artist who saw the last days of the, the Inquisition. And you can see that the accused have to wear this special garment called a San Benito. San, San Benito is the patron saint of Europe. And whenever you're outdoors or out of the cell, you have to wear this if you're a suspect or if you've been uh, convicted in any way. Uh, and it had this long pointed hat. If you go to the Jewish Museum in Cordoba, they have some replicas, very good, uh, good display they have there. Um, just opposite Roger Garodi's old house, his wife is still, still living there. Uh, so a long, long kind of dunce's hat, and it would be painted with flames and demons to remind you that you know, these people were, were going to go to hell. Uh, the shirt of flame. Another symbol of the Inquisition, not shown here, was the famous green cross. That was a symbol of the Inquisition, which would be unveiled at moments of triumph during the interrogations and during the, the trial. This continued uh, until 1826, when the Inquisition uh, put an end to its last victim, a certain Cayetano de Ripoll, probably not anybody connected to Judaism or Islam, but it seems that he had the wrong ideas about the incarnation. He said, Jesus is not the son of God. Uh, so he was executed. To the annoyance of the church, he's executed by the civil authorities. This is after Spain has been under Napoleonic ex, uh, occupation, and Napoleon really didn't like the Inquisition. He shut it down. After the end of Napoleon, 1815, uh, it's revived again briefly. And so the civil authorities accept the sentence, but they have him hanged. And the church is really angry. And they have the body exhumed, stuffed in a barrel. The barrel is painted with these flames and demons, and then it's covered with tar and ritually burned, just so they can feel that the proper punishment has been done. And after that time, in Europe, with the beginnings of the Enlightenment ideas seeping into Spain, after that time, the Inquisition in Spain is stopped. The Roman Inquisition persists longer. Um, the Inquisition, even though it knew that torture was kind of unreliable and some people would say anything and everything, uh, did try to systematize it. So they had manuals which explained the different levels of resistance, the different strategies which people would employ. A doctor would always examine the detainee first. Again, they do this in Guantanamo. Uh, and they have uh, a fixed number. It was very strictly regulated. Um, one of the most popular methods was a kind of water torture called the toca which is quite similar but different to the American tradition of waterboarding. Um, up to 10 litres of water would be forcibly um, forced by mouth into the individual uh, to cause extreme pain. Um, but it would always be for a specific period, usually for 45 minutes, and then it would have to stop. The priest would turn the glass and it would have to stop and then there would be another medical examination. And they wouldn't do this for an extended period because they knew after a while you're not going to get anything. Uh, unlike Guantanamo, some of you might have seen <laughs> the New York Times feature about Abu Zubaydah, probably not the kind of person uh, that a CMC would take tea with, but he's been going through this for 16 years now, completely out of control. But with many of the same techniques, nudity, for instance, the use of religious symbolisms, you reach for the cross at Guantanamo if you're ready to talk, that kind of thing um, is still well recorded. So he's one of the forever prisoners, but the Inquisition would never do that. They didn't go that far. Uh, another method, there would be a pulley whereby your arms would be tied behind your back and then you'd be jerked upwards, um, which could dislocate your limbs. There was the rack for stretching you. Um, it was very rare for somebody simply to be acquitted 
because the Inquisition as part of the church couldn't be seen publicly to have made a mistake. So when they thought, this is rubbish, just his jealous neighbor is trying to grab his land or something, uh, they would suspend the case. Uh, but acquittals are pretty rare. So the Inquisition is vested in this kind of sense of the church's infallibility. And the, the building, the palace of the Inquisition was always seen as a kind of secret, holy, mysterious place. If you had confessed and were sentenced to something and then were caught again, you were a relapsed impenitent. Uh, and that meant that you couldn't be let off, you had to be executed. But they would try to get you to be reconciled to the church between the time of your sentence and the actual execution. And the reason why people might be tempted to do that, and uh, that would be the great moment, the prisoner has repented, and that would be the unveiling of the green cross as part of this very complex process, was that uh, you would be uh, regarded as somebody who would be saved, even though the execution couldn't be, uh, couldn't be annulled. Uh, and you would be executed quickly. You would be strangled, usually, before being burnt. So it was a merciful, merciful end. So this was always a, a, a temptation. Um, but the main purpose, according to modern historians, was not really so much as to save the sinner's soul, although many of the priests believed that that's what it was all about, but to terrify the population into compliance. Uh, if you go to uh, the Palace of the Inquisition in Malta, which is one of the best... Uh, museums of the Inquisition. In Spain, they tend to kind of suppress them. I, I looked for the Palace of the Inquisition in Madrid once, and it's become an Irish pub. <laughs> you have to figure out exactly where it was. It's kind of a bad memory. Uh, but in Malta, they've um, really re recreated it. You can see the archives. And the torture chamber has a big window with bars so that passers-by can hear the interrogation, can hear the screaming as a means of kind of uh, teaching them a lesson. Um, yep, so then there would be the highly public ritual. You'd be led out, your confession might be read out, which was when the green cross was unveiled, uh, and then there would be the ceremony of the auto da fe, which was a hugely popular, um, uh, one of the great kind of carnivals of traditional Spain. People would travel for weeks in order to see a great auto da fe, and there would be vendors and street performers, as well as the main religious ritual. So here's one of the famous pictures of the last great auto da fe in Madrid, 1680, in the Plaza Mayor. The place is still there, the main square of uh, Madrid. This was an uh, auto da fe, an act of faith, a religious ceremony that was integrated into the mass. So, first of all, the accused sentence would be brought. You can see them here, just about in the crowd. Not a very clear image, perhaps, wearing the San Benitos, each with two priests by him to try and reconcile him. Um, so, the ritual would start as a mass. The ordinary of the mass would be said, at the end of which they would pronounce the sentences. And then there would be a sermon, and then those who'd been excommunicated were led away because they couldn't take the... Um, the, the, the Eucharist, the proper of the Mass. <coughs> and then you would have the unveiling of the Green Cross and they would sing a particular hymn. Um, yep. So if you were a relapsed heretic or you'd been sentenced to death, uh, then you would be consigned to the flames. This was the preferred punishment. Uh, and that had to be carried out within five days of the, the Alto da Fe. The inquisitors don't show, don't show up for the Inquisition. Uh, the burning, very slow process, surprisingly perhaps, might take up to five hours before you'd finally expire. There'd be a big crowd there. Um, and if you were able to, you might bribe the guards <coughs> to put green wood around your friend or your loved one because that would generate a lot of smoke and therefore they'd, they'd die of asphyxiation um, relatively quickly. So, at the largest autos da fe, you'd have maybe a hundred or so people burnt simultaneously. As years went by, this is one of the last public ones, um, the church starts to realize that actually for those who sympathize with the accused, um, this is a kind of triumphant procession of martyrs. If you're secretly Jewish, 
who are secretly Lutheran, who are secretly Muslim, and you see your imam or your rabbi dressed up like this being taken to the execution. This is kind of a, a strengthening thing uh, and strengthens your sense of yourself as a victimized, martyred, righteous community. So they stop having these big, hugely popular open things and uh, they hold the outdoor de fe in churches. But this one, which is the last, as far as I can tell, there was only one Muslim who was executed at this uh, 1680 outdoor de fe, a guy called Mustafa, who was from Seville, originally Lazaro Fernandez, and he was an Elche, obviously converted to Islam after the Reconquista, and these were people who were really in for it. Um, and the records say he was pertinacious in his adopted faith and was burnt alive. In other words, it means that last moment, when you still had the opportunity of repenting, he didn't do that, and he chose to remain steadfast in Islam and chose the five hours or whatever it was of uh, torment rather than uh, compromising himself. The very last moment when you were tied to the stake and the uh, uh, wood was around you, uh, a priest would come and would hold up a crucifix on a long stick. And if you kissed it, that was regarded as a sufficient sign of your repentance. And then they would strangle you so you wouldn't uh, die uh, the most painful way. But um, it seems this guy Mustafa, Allah irhamu, decided not to kiss the crucifix. So uh, we won't dwell on this image. Um, execution by burning, again, the, it was less ritualized. The clergy would not be there. A meal would be arranged for them. And then they go back to their parishes and the bishoprics. Um, and it would be left to the secular arm, actually, to perform the, uh, the formal execution. So that's the Spanish Inquisition. Most of what I've said applies also to the Roman Inquisition. This is later. 1542, Pope Paul III establishes it. Uh, and it's the Roman Inquisition that ends up um, sentencing Galileo, for instance, ends up executing Giordano Bruno, one of the great kind of liberalizing theologians and mystics uh, of the 16th century. Um, but the main reason is because it, the Roman Inquisition had a jurisdiction over the central Mediterranean, basically. And they were afraid that as part of the kind of front line with the world of Islam, <coughs> they were dealing with a lot of people who had converted to Islam. They were also worried about Reformation, Calvinists, Lutherans, and so forth. But essentially, um, it's about these converts to Islam. So in 1574, the Inquisition is invited to Malta by the rulers of Malta, who are called the Knights of Malta, who are crusading order. So, yeah. <coughs> it's the threat of Islam. So this French historian, Anna Braghini, who's at the University of Côte d'Azur, who's one of the authorities on this Maltese Inquisition, <coughs> observes this. Very soon, the Inquisitor's work exceeded the simple defense of Catholicism against heresy and more and more specialized in the fight against a new threat to the identity and homogeneity of Maltese society, apostasy, and conversion to Islam. This was generally their main fear and the reason why they built this Palace of the Inquisition in Valletta. <coughs> Again, Napoleon finally put a stop to that. But why Malta in particular? Well, Malta has a very interesting and agonistic history. There you can see one of their prime tourist attractions. It's in the museum in Gozol. They call it the Maimona Stone, which is a Muslim tombstone, perfectly legible. And they're all really proud of it. And it is a very beautiful thing. <coughs> it's in the year 870 that the Aghlabid dynasty, ruling in North Africa, conquers Malta from the Byzantines. A certain Amir called Sawada, bin Muhammad, and they build the city of Medina, which is still called Medina, in the center of Malta. Some sources say there's already lots of Muslims in Malta because Eastern Christianity was generally more <coughs> tolerant of Muslim presence than the Christians of the West. 1053, the Byzantines try and take it back 
By that time, it's already a Muslim island. They don't succeed. <coughs> Was there a continual Christian presence? In Malta today, where there's a lot of Islamophobia and bad feeling, and they're, in a way, on the new front line against the kind of Muslim boat people crossing the Mediterranean. Uh, they like to think of themselves as a tradition of Christians going right back. But most historians would say no. <coughs> the island was basically entirely, Christ entirely Muslim um, during the, the later Al-Khalabid period. And in fact, a very thriving Muslim culture, as you can see from this. <coughs> Mosques and so forth, completely obliterated now. But the Maltese today still speak a kind of Arabic, seculo Arabic, which was the kind of strange uh, Arabic with lots of Italian words that was spoken in the central Mediterranean island world of the Dar al Islam, Sicily, mainly. Uh, but they still have Arabic, and in many ways the culture reflects Muslim uh, traditions, the traditional faldetta, the dark women's dress that they used to wear until a generation ago really looks very like a kind of traditional uh, Muslim dress. 1090, the Normans invade from Sicily. The Normans in this period are pretty tolerant of Muslims, sometimes to the fury of the popes. And <coughs> Islam is still practiced on the island for 100 years. 1122, they tried to rebel unsuccessfully. 1249, the final edict of deportation. No more Muslims legally in Malta. And uh, the Normans deport them to a kind of Muslim ghetto town in Italy called Lucera. Uh, and then finally, the survivors are forced into baptism. They're forced to change their names, and a Spanish type of uh, uh, system takes over. Uh, in 1429, the Tunisians uh, try to recapture the island, but are unsuccessful. Now, for our period, these are the guys we need to know about Crusaders. Crusades didn't stop with Salah ad -Din. They continue, uh, inaugurated by various popes. These are the Knights of St. John who move from Palestine to Rhodes. Suleiman the Magnificent defeats them in Rhodes, but is so impressed by their martial prowess <coughs> that he allows them to depart, and they go and fortify Malta, 1530. The Grand Master, this very strange idea of monks with swords takes possession of the island. They don't really make themselves terribly popular, even though they're fellow Catholics, which the Byzantines hadn't been, because they don't like the Maltese language and they make Italian the official language. <coughs> they become very wealthy because they're engaged in a form of piracy. They're corsairs using their galleys. They tended to prefer galleys, usually manned by Muslim slaves against uh, Muslim shipping in the Mediterranean. 1565, the Ottomans, really annoyed by the fact that the galleys were raiding Hajj ships and so forth, and people thought they were going to the Kaaba, and they end up enslaved in Malta. Um, they launch the <coughs> Grand Siege, uh, 1565, an absolutely apocalyptic event. By this time, of course, there's gunpowder, aquabuses, mortars and so forth, titanic event, but the knights hold on, the Ottomans sail away. So the Roman Inquisition in Malta, slowly getting to my subject here, um, this is the uh, building which is still there, which is now this uh, uh, quite instructive, if somewhat sobering museum. It's been reconstructed really well. You can see the, where the Grand Inquisitor would live, um, uh, where the archives are, these huge uh, volumes where everything was taken down. Um, it's in Vittoriosa, um, which is the district of Valletta. What happened in this place is, was quite similar to the procedures which I've described in connection with the Spanish Inquisition. And as with much of the Spanish Inquisition, the archives give an in the historian a real treasure trove of information because they would try and write down everything that the accused said 
<laughs> and I've even seen some transcripts, which is people under torture, mostly it's screaming, but they even try and write down the screams. <laughs> Very extraordinary. And how people are calling out to various saints and screaming again, but the priest still... <laughs> Uh, grim, because presumably that's a, a verbatim record of, of somebody's agony. Um, so we have these archives, and you can see throughout the history of the Maltese Inquisition, the great fear was that we used to be Muslim. There's Muslims next door. The Ottoman Empire is the world's great superpower. Their ships are everywhere. Uh, we need to watch out for anybody who has relapsed from Catholicism into the evil Saracenic or Ishmaelite heresy. This is their main thing. Now, why were they so concerned? Well, here you can see another modern historian, or what, uh, historian of the time, sorry, 17th century, which is from our period, where a German visitor talking about this very hierarchical society <coughs> with the Knights of St. John, who mainly came from Catalonia, Spain, and so forth, and weren't Maltese, ruling over a very poor, illiterate population. Uh, you can see that this historian says, the Maltese have to be disciplined and restrained by the Knights to keep them away from the idea of going over to their Turkish enemies. In other words, it was kind of the idea, his perception was that Malta was a kind of prison and that the local population really, many of whom were sailors, fishermen, and had engaged, engaged with Muslims, didn't buy the official view of Muslims as idol worshippers <coughs> uh, and murderers, and were really interested and found the official ideology difficult, because we don't have many accounts from the Maltese themselves during this period, at least none that would dare to express such a view. We have to look at second-hand accounts such as this. Um, but nonetheless, historians say that whole boats full of volunteers went from Malta to North Africa to accept Islam and to look for more freedoms in North Africa. <clears throat> Why would they perceive that? We'll talk about it a little bit later. <clears throat> um, but here's one testimony that we do have, a certain Gaudentio Magri from Valletta. Having come to know that in Turkey and other heretical countries there is freedom of conscience, I wish to be there, <clears throat> is what he's saying to the inquisitors. Turkey is more free, that was their perception. It wasn't a single monolithic one confession society, but the Ottoman Empire was really diverse and they didn't really care what you were. Um, also, there's no feudal system in the Ottoman lands of North Africa. It's very meritocratic. They had what's called the Timar system, particularly in the Eastern Mediterranean. If you'd served the Sultan with distinction, perhaps on the field of battle, he would give you a title and a landed estate. Here is 50 villages in Bosnia and so forth, but you didn't really own them the way you did if Edward III gave you some land in England. Uh, instead, you had the right to the taxation from that land for your lifetime. And when you died, it didn't go to your eldest son the way it always did in Western Europe. It went back to the state. So it tended to be much more meritocratic, and people who were of quite simple origin could get to the top quite quickly. You just had to distinguish yourself in battle or in performing some service to the sultan in his arsenals or his mint, and you would get one of these timars. This meant that just about anybody could rise up through the uh, Ottoman system. And we're beginning to note, because Europe has not really been very happy with this realization, how incredibly important converts, European converts to Islam were to the whole Ottoman state. Um, this is a nice book that came out quite recently. Tobias Graf, The Sultan's Renegades, Christian European Converts to Islam and the Making of the Ottoman Elite, 1575 to 1610. Oxford University Press, a very good piece of work in which he combs through all of the records, the archives, travellers' tales and so forth to depict the image that Europe kind of knew but found itself really allergic to, which is that the converts played a hitherto underestimated or unsuspected role um, in the Ottoman <coughs> government and administration. Uh, so, Here's a quote that he provides from the Venetian ambassador, the bylaw. 
<coughs> Matteo Zane, who died in 1594, who divided all of Ottoman elite society into born Turks, Turks, native Turkish speakers, and renegades, these European converts. And he says, the career options for the born Turks was usually in the Elmiya, the religious hierarchy. They would become Qadis, Muftis, and so forth. Converts very rarely got into that. And the latter, he said, entrusted to their hands the army, the government, the wealth, and in conclusion, the whole empire. So his perception in Istanbul was that it's the converts who are running the show. And in the 16th century, of the 24 grand viziers of the Ottoman Empire, only four of them were born Muslims. The others were Croats, Hungarians, whatever. The Ottomans didn't care. If you were capable, you could get to be prime minister, not sultan. You might become the sultan's wife. Rather different arrangements there. Um, so here's another example. John Barton was the second ever British ambassador to the Ottomans, time of Elizabeth I. And in 1591, he writes a diplomatic note to Lord Burley, who is the Lord High Treasurer, telling him that the Ottoman High Admiral, really important post, the Kapudan Pasha, has died. And Chiralogul Yusuf Sinan Pasha has been appointed to be his successor. And then he notes, Hassan Pasha had been Venetian, Chiralogul had been Genoese. So they've got to be first sea lord in English term, but they weren't even locals. You know, that's like nowadays, you know, a, a, a refugee from Togo becoming you know, first sea lord. In England, that's kind of even today regarded as something very unusual. For the Ottomans, that's usually what happened. <clears throat> These senior people were usually people who had been promoted through this meritocratic system, became aristocrats, but not feudal lords, because there's no feudal system, there's no enslavement or ensurfment of the village population. And this looked really quite attractive to a lot of people on the edges. If you're a Maltese guy and you fish for sardines <coughs> off the coast of Algeria and you talk to other fishermen, <coughs> you'll meet converts, you'll see it's quite interesting on the other side. You also had, uh, and so the uh, the Knights of, jo of St. John were raiding the Muslim coastline and taking slaves and taking treasure. That was their vocation, that's what they did. The defense of Malta and pursuing the Bellum Sanctum, the holy war against a Muslim adversary. And they would capture ships and they would enslave uh, the Muslims that they found on board. And anybody who looked as if he'd once been a Christian, they'd send him off to the palace of the Inquisition for further questioning. Sometimes they would capture women as well on the ships or uh, in raids on the coast. These wouldn't be used for, as galley slaves. The most common use for them would be to be sold into the brothels of the coastal towns of Italy. We don't have much information about them um, for obvious reasons. Usually their life expectancy would be quite short. But the problem of the renegades what do you do with the fact that your most significant adversaries on board ship throughout the Mediterranean are actually not Turks or Berbers or Arabs, <coughs> but your own people who've gone over to Islam and kind of like it in the more fluid societies of the Muslim Mediterranean? <coughs> Initially, the Inquisition in Malta had been created to deal with some of the knights <coughs> who were flirting with Protestantism. <coughs> but very quickly it became clear what the real issue was. The expulsion of the Muslims from Spain began really the age of the Corsairs. The first Corsairs tended to be Spanish, wanted to get their own back, and so would sail out of various Moroccan, Algerian, Tunisian ports, <coughs> specifically to attack Spanish shipping. And it becomes a running war. And when Europeans free Europeans went to North Africa, they were often appalled by the huge number of the population that were actually Europeans who'd become Muslim. So a certain Diego de Aedo, um, when he went to Algiers, he lists about 30 different European nationalities um, that he finds there. And he says, half of the population of Algiers is made up of renegades. Europeans who've converted, come to North Africa, or they've been enslaved by Ottoman ships, and then they've been given their freedom, and they uh, stay as Muslims. 
And the Corsairs, the Muslim seamen, are almost all renegades. Um, so the Inquisition of Murcia in Spain deals with uh, the prisoners from a Muslim ship that's been captured by a Neapolitan galley. And they find in this ship one French Muslim, two Portuguese Muslims, three Spanish Muslims, and two English Muslims. The most famous of all of the uh, Corsair expeditions, which was arrayed on Iceland, uh, was led by Murad Reis, who was actually a Fleming from Belgium now, Jan Jans. But the English Corsairs, kind of particularly interesting, there's three of them. Um, incidentally, in case you're wondering where these images come from, uh, uh, I've been cheating by using an AI bot in order to generate the images of these simple people who wouldn't usually get themselves depicted and it makes it more visually interesting. <coughs> uh, it's a nice minor uh, game for you to play. So I tell the bot, create these images in the style of Zorbaran or Caravaggio or Canaletto. So see if you can get this artificial intelligence mind resonating with you. I think this is supposed to be Canaletto. Anyway, these are supposed to be three English cor uh, Corsairs. <coughs> Most of the Englishmen who are Muslims in this area come from London, Plymouth, Exmouth, Weymouth, and Bristol. And we know this because it's part of the interrogation. So examples, Thomas Haddock of Newcastle, Philip Pitch of Plymouth, George Crampton of London. There was one guy who said he was just Mammy of Algiers, who was English, but he said he couldn't even remember his English name. Alexander Harris hmm, was an English guy, arrested, and he said, oh, they forced me to become Muslim, they forcibly circumcised me, and I'm so happy to see you guys. <laughs> The inquisitors said, well, if your conversion was not sincere, why were you raiding our ships for seven years? And that kind of clinched it. Certain Francis Barnes, who the Inquisition uh, records indicated that he wanted to continue praying and fasting while in prison and so forth. Uh, a lot of them. Here's another, my favorite, because it's from Norfolk. <coughs> Samson Rowley, Hassan Aga, who becomes you know, one of the chief figures in the... <coughs> Regency of Algiers, dies after about 1581. Another kind of even better known one, and there were Elizabethan plays and poems about him, <coughs> famous pirate, uh, Jack Ward, Yusuf Reis. If you look at the BBC History website, you'll find that he was the original Jack Sparrow. When they wrote those Pirates of the Caribbean thing, they looked for characters. They actually based it on this uh, rather wild guy from Faversham who'd been given by the British government a letter of mark, which is basically a license to piracy against Spanish ships. And he died in 1622 and did quite well for himself. Uh, he's buried apparently in, in Tunis. Yeah, Captain Ward. The thing that the church was most anxious about was its own people going over to Islam. And this is a source of considerable anxiety. We've already seen the Spanish Inquisition had banned the learning of Arabic because they were afraid of this. They didn't want arguments about the Trinity. No, you just find out what people are guilty of. <clears throat> so in the archives, and this comes from one of my favorite books, uh, Bartholomé Ben Nassar, who's a French historian, his book, Les Chrétiens d'Allah, Allah's Christians, which is all about um, the Inquisition archives and what they tell us about European Muslims at the time. So these, <coughs> this data comes from him. A Franciscan priest, Cristobal Rodriguez became Ali, became a soldier. 1625, he gets caught by the Inquisition in Murcia, who sentenced him. He's still only 22. Uh, a famous Augustinian monk in Algiers uh, converted to Islam and became very active in the da'wah amongst Christian prisoners uh, in the banyos of Algiers. There seems to have been quite a large number of convert priests, at least according to Ben Nassar. So there's the story of one of the respected uh, priests in Algiers, Nicolas Botin, who went from saying mass to the Mufti's house, comes out wearing a turban. Great scandal for the Christian population there. Alonso de Luna, <coughs> theology student who'd been from Granada, but an old Christian. <coughs> Their policy in settling southern Spain was quite similar to what the Israelis are doing on the West Bank. You kind of 
force people out and bring in your own people who you can trust to take, take the land. So he's from one of the settlers. Very educated guy, been in correspondence with the Pope. 1619, he's captured. He's become Muslim. They torture him. He confesses. He gets life imprisonment. So these are the kind of later equivalent of the Elches. Okay. Uh, this is the actual torture chamber in the museum in Malta, where you can see most of the things that they would use. There's a, a, a press that squeezes your ankles, um, and then there's a kind of sharp horse that you sit on while weights are attached to your feet. And after half an hour or so, it becomes very pa painful, and the priest is sitting at the desk writing down everything that you say. <clears throat> the problem with the English prisoners in particular, as becomes clear from these archives, is that they're kind of double heretics. <coughs> When they converted to Islam, they'd already been Protestants, which in the eyes of the church was kind of just as bad. Um, so usually, English sailors in the Muslim regencies of North Africa are aware that one day they might have to <coughs> prove to the Inquisition that they were real Christians, had to learn about Catholicism so that they could persuade the, uh, the priests that actually they hadn't been heretic Protestants, but they'd been Catholics, and then they'd been wickedly converted to Islam, and it was all a big mistake. Um, so <laughs> it was a complex process for them, but it was something that they would talk about uh, at shore and on land in North Africa, what to say if you get caught, which quite often happened. And of course, there's certain convergences. The Protestants, like the Muslims, didn't like images. They didn't believe in the sacrament of confession. They didn't respect the Pope. So in the eyes of some of the priests, there's a kind of similarity there. The most common strategy, if you were under uh, interrogation, was of course to say, I was forced into it. I maintained my Christianity in secret. I've always been a Catholic. So one guy, Albert True, who was from Corfe Castle, which I think is in Devon, amazed the priest by knowing all the answers recited the catechism, and here are the saints, and here is the papal authority, and they released him. <clears throat> Another guy from Plymouth, Lewis Crew, <coughs> confessed that he'd been practicing Islam for 13 years. They sentenced him to the galleys. When they questioned him again four years later, he gave such a wonderful, perfect exposition of Catholic scholastic theology and metaphysics, the power of the pontiff and so forth, that they said, all right, and they kind of unchained him. You can imagine that it was difficult, but there were, like this guy Mustafa from uh, Seville, <coughs> the stubborn ones, as they were called. So, Mammy the Englishman, who was originally Jonas of Dartmouth, faced with the inquisitors at Barcelona, insisted that Islam was superior. He wasn't going to make the pretense. A Sicilian called Antonio de Lipari, according to witnesses, believed in the sect of Muhammad with obstinacy, claimed that the Muslim religion is superior. He threw a rosary on the ground and stamped on it, refuses to bow to a statue of Christ on the cross and covers his eyes. A guy from Menorca, Josef Hiner, said, the Christian God is a bit of bread and wine. George Saba, a Greek, 1679, the Roman Inquisition is trying him, or at least inquiring, at uh, Palermo. And the head of the prison was a, a Dominican. Dominicans tend to be highly educated theologically. And they have theological exchanges. They do actually talk about doctrine. He goes to his trial, and in the corridor, he sees another Dominican priest bowing to a crucifix. And so the Greek guy says, what are you looking at? What are you doing? And he says, this is my Lord. And he urges George to purify his soul before the trial. <clears throat> George says, obviously a courageous guy, what you worship as God is not God. What you take to be God is only a piece of wood. It is written over the gate of heaven that no one shall enter who has not believed in Muhammad. I am a Turk. I wish to die as a Turk, and I will give my life a thousand times to defend the law of Muhammad. The Dominican said, the day will come when you will see your error. And George says, if God killed us both this instant, you would see how I go to heaven while you go to hell. So by no means all of them were taking this kind of sharia legitimate thing of pretending to be something else. Uh, these kind of dramatic heroics are not necessarily required of, of Muslims. 
Some of them wouldn't take that rukhsa and would rather you know, continue with the shahada and pay the final penalty. So finally, we come to today's uh, story, having given you the background. Cosantino of Paros. And I'm taking most of this stuff from really a great book by a historian called Kenneth Gambin. I'll talk about it a little bit later on, but he's done an admirable job of sifting through the archives and giving. I'd recommend that you order it, actually. It's a short book, paperback. You can get it online. Um, so most of this comes from him. So Paros is a little island, now full of kind of naked Germans toasting on the beach. You can imagine what it's like now, but back then, uh, it's a quiet island, a Greek island, in the central Aegean, in the Cyclades. Complex political history, Byzantine, then Crusaders who persecuted the Greeks, then the Venetians who didn't like the Greek much either. The Orthodox Church was suppressed. <coughs> 1537, the Ottomans turn up, and it becomes Ottoman until the beginning of the 19th century. If you're interested, there's a book by Greek historian Eleftheria Zay on the history of Paros in the Ottoman centuries. <coughs> Quiet, dozy, small island, <coughs> apparently with a very small number of Muslims. The Ottomans didn't really have a policy of settlement um, unless they were dealing with specifically difficult areas. So maybe 20 or so Muslims. They appointed a Qadi, poor guy, <laughs> didn't have enough to afford a servant. <coughs> and when the Knights of Malta turned up, he would have to hide because he would certainly be captured and enslaved by them. <clears throat> Sometimes uh, the Venetians would raid or the knights would raid. They would only oppress the Greeks. <clears throat> Generally, they couldn't find the Muslims. And then after they left, the Greek population would go on to persecute the island's Catholics, kind of Northern Ireland type situation. <clears throat> but the island was famous for the Ottomans in that it seems to have been the birthplace of one of the best known Ottoman women, Nurbanu Sultan. Many Turks will remember this name. Nurbanu Sultan dies in 1583. She's a valid Sultan. In other words, she's the mother of a Sultan, in this case, Murad III. Historians argue, was she a Venetian from the island, therefore Catholic, or was she a Greek from the island, therefore Orthodox? Uh, but certainly she was famous for her beauty, for her intelligence, and as she moved up through the Ottoman female hierarchy, she kind of co-administered the whole empire uh, besides the Grand Vizier Sokollo Mehmed Pasha, uh, who was also of convert background. He was originally Orthodox from Herzegovina. And it seems that she took religion seriously because she built a number of mosques in Istanbul. If you go to Uskudar, <coughs> And you go up the hill, the top of the hill, there is her mosque, uh, the Atik Valley de Sultan Kuliesi. Really nice, one of the oldest Ottoman mosques in Uskudar with a great view, which has a dervish lodge, I think, for the Sha'baniya next to it, uh, and also a medrese, <coughs> which when I first visited was kind of a ruin, but Recep Shenturk and his people have resurrected it and it's become a center of higher Islamic studies and looks really nice now. But you know, she is the patroness of that building. All of the great mosques in Uskudar um, were built by women. Uh, Mihrima Sultan built the great mosque by the, by the sea. And Ottoman sort of gossip, Uskudar is the place where you go if you're angry with your husband. <laughs> Anyway, but yeah, the female mosques there. So we move on. So the knights are raiding, and our hero, Cosantino, of whose life we only have the testimony of the Inquisition archives, um, was born on the island of Paris in 1609. And he, his nickname was Manetta which is kind of Italian for somebody with a defect in his hand. We don't know exactly what it was, but it was quite visible. Born Orthodox Greek. Not many opportunities for teenagers in Paros in the 16th century. So he uh, becomes a sailor at the age of 15, goes to sea with a Greek captain who treated him really badly. And when he'd finished his journey, the captain kind of kicked him off with a friend who was a carpenter on the ship, not paying him. So this kind of leaves him sore, and he joins another ship. And this ship is captured by a Muslim vessel from North Africa, 
and he's taken to prison in Tripoli, now of course in, in Libya. And they say, well, you're a sailor, you're going to sail with us. Um, and so he joined a Corsair ship, ship with a Muslim captain, but you didn't have to be Muslim to sail on a Corsair ship. At some point, we don't know when exactly, he took his shahada. On board, it would probably just mean raising your finger, saying the, the words, maybe having a haircut. There were also certain rituals at the time. If you were a sailor, you probably had a red cap, which indicated you were a Christian. You were supposed to throw it on the floor and stamp on it. Then you'd put on a white turban, and then you would be regarded as a member of the Ummah of Islam. Sometimes the Ottomans liked to have really elaborate processions. <coughs> um, with janissaries and bands and you get taken to the saint's tomb, to the mosque you, and it, everybody is cheering and it becomes a kind of public festival <coughs> for these guys who are kind of on the borders anyway and probably knew a lot about Islam anyway and kind of eastern Mediterranean oriental type people anyway <coughs> it wasn't really perceived as a, a big deal but Cosantino is now Rajab seven years uh, he works as a corsair, doesn't want to go back to boring old Paros. Uh, but in 1631, his ship is captured by the other side, a galley of the Knights of John, St. John out of Malta. <clears throat> and when he gets to Malta, <clears throat> he pretends to be a born Muslim, <clears throat> in which case he has problems, but the Inquisition can't touch him. <clears throat> but somebody who knew him recognizes him and denounces him to the Inquisition. <clears throat> As we've seen, the usual inquisitorial practice is to hold the prisoner without informing him of the charge. You just get kind of softened up as you reflect, the hope being that after a while you've confessed to something. Cosentino already knows what the charge is, his being suspected of conversion to Islam. So he does the usual thing, saying, I wasn't truly converted, I don't know much about religion, I'd be constrained, I was always really a Christian at heart. And he remembers part of the Lord's Prayer, which he recites in Greek to try and impress <coughs> the inquisitors. But the Grand Inquisitor, Martino Alfieri, doesn't believe him. He's seen this too many times, so he orders him to be tortured quite severely uh, to see what he's really going to say. But despite the torture, he sticks to his story. After a year, October 17th, 1632, the Inquisitor kind of shrugs and gives up on the torture and just sentences him to five years in prison. He can't work as a galley slave because of his uh, crippled hand. He's also uh, required to go to the Church of St. Lawrence, holding a candle, the San Benito, before the altar, De Vehementi, vehemently denouncing Islam. So he's stuck in the jail. Again, the cells are still there. Um, hasn't really changed since his time. You get quite a good sense of uh, what it's like. Uh, and in jail, he meets somebody who he already knows, who's also from Paros, Joanne, who has also become Murad. They've actually sailed together, so nice to see a familiar face. And they try to figure out what can we do about this miserable situation. We'd love to get back to Tripoli somehow. Now, the prison has a warder called Giuseppe Galdes. He's an old guy, and he's really lazy, and he used to break the rules. He used to chat to the prisoners when he got bored. He'd go to their cells to drink with them. He'd play dice or cards. And sometimes, when he was feeling lazy, he would let a prisoner out and say, get me my macaroni from the kitchen, please. He's a kind of original sloppy Giuseppe. I, think there's a, I don't think the pizza is named after him, but it's a kind of stereotype. So you get them sweeping the corridors and cooking. Um, Gambin's book will, will describes all of this. Sometimes he'd even take the prisoners up to the first floor of the palace to watch a fiesta or a carnival that was taking place, or even take them to the door of the prison, which he'd leave open, saying, look, here's the, here's the procession. <clears throat> so this, of course, gives them an idea. And they talk to fellow prisoners, a certain Mami Reis and a Giovanni Cagliari, and they oil a padlock during the day with oil that they have purloined from the kitchen so that it will be silent when they finally force it. It will make a loud clinking noise that will 
get sloppy Giuseppe out of his kind of alcoholic coma, trotting along to see what's going on, silent. So they do this, and they climb onto the roof of the palace. And then they, with a couple of garments tied together, they climb down into the next yard where they free the two guys from Paros, plus another guy who's just turned up, a Russian called Ahmed, uh, and the five of them escape from the prison. <clears throat> and they leave Valletta, and they hide in the fields, moving around, eating anything that they can find that's growing. <coughs> Fugitives. <coughs> they know the Inquisition is sending the soldiers after them. But then they have a dilemma. His Greek friend Morad walks with a crutch. He can't move very fast. Should they leave him behind and make straight for the coast and steal a boat or bribe somebody and escape, but without Morad? And it seems what they do is decide not to abandon him. And so in a rather slow pace, they reach the coast to try and uh, uh, get back to North Africa. And at this time, not just in Malta, but all around, the southern Mediterranean coast of Italy and so forth. The, the, the boats and the beaches are guarded because there's so many people trying to get across. After four days, unsuccessfully trying to get a boat, they're recaptured and they're taken right back to the Inquisitor's palace. They wonder if they're going to be punished, but actually it's Giuseppe who gets the punishment because the escape is seen, is seen as being his fault. They said, well, we didn't want to go to a Muslim country, we just wanted to be free and What's wrong with that? But in any case, they're back in jail. Here you have Caravaggio's nice painting of Recep and Murad looking a bit thoughtful in their cell. So as a result of this escape attempt, there's no more torture. The sentences are not added to. The problem the authorities have is that there's insufficient space in the jail, and generally people get released before the end of their sentences. So Murad, the one with a bad leg, is released in 1637. He's been given a life sentence, but only serves four years. And they say, well, because you can't move very fast, you can get anywhere you like in the island, but you can only leave the island with the permission of the Inquisition. So he finds a little tobacco shop in Valletta, and he becomes a tobacconist. However, he doesn't stay there. Whenever the coast is clear, obviously he wants to get back to the Darul Islam. He jumps his bail, gets on a night of Malta ship that goes to Livorno in Italy. He travels overland from Livorno to Venice, which is very well connected to the Muslim world, and then takes a Greek ship to Tripoli. So after a month from his abandoning his shop, he's back in North Africa. He's actually made it. So he goes to see the Pasha, uh, the governor, and explains his story. Now, the Ottomans didn't have anything like the Inquisition. They're not going to figure out, well, you became a Christian again, but you're originally a Christian, what's going on? They didn't have anything like the Inquisition. And he said, well, I went to church in Malta every Sunday, but you know, whenever I left, I'd kept the host, the wafer in my mouth, and when nobody was looking out, spit it out on the ground. Christianity never entered my heart. Uh, and then he throws his red berry on the ground, throws down his rosary, stamps on them, announces that his back, his Murad again, wants to die in Islam. The Pasha's perfectly happy, no investigation required, gives him a place to stay, gives him some money. What about our hero, Cosantino, the guy who doesn't have a bad leg but has the bad hand? <coughs> He's been given a five-year sentence, but after only two, they let him out because somebody who becomes his owner, effectively is a slave, Giacchi Paulet, had asked the inquisitors, let him out, he can be useful to me, he's just being useless and lazy in the prison, I can put him to work. Paulet then sells him to another owner who uses him as a deckhand because that's his skill on board his ship. In 1637, the ship docks in Rijeka, which is now in Croatia, and Cosantina goes for a walk, doesn't come back, makes his way to Venice again, finds a Greek ship which takes him to Zante, which is a Greek island, and then another ship, he goes home to Paros, to his home island, to see his family. 
but he never gets there. On the way, the ship anchors at a place called Modon, which is a fortress down in uh, the Peloponnese, uh, which is famous for uh, uh, the massacre of its, it was entirely Muslim by the time of the Greek War of Independence, they were all wiped out. Uh, that's in 1826 or something. But at this time, it's a very mixed place. It had been a Venetian fortress. So Muslims who knew him in his seven years at sea recognize him. And they say, what's going on? Rejeb Bey, and he tells them the story of his adventures and how he's escaped. They give him some money, they give him some Muslim clothes, so he's Rajab again. It's Ramadan, he fasts. So now he goes to Tripoli, and the Pasha again says, fine, I understand your story, and gives him his back pay. Uh, and Uh, the Pasha says, you have to go to sea again. So he does, and happily meets his old friend Murad again, and they go happily out to sea. After a few days on the horizon, they see the galleys of the knights with a big Maltese cross. Their hearts sink. One ship against six, and galleys are very manoeuvrable because they can do whatever they like, even if there's no wind. Uh, rowers tend to tire out after about six hours, but during those six hours, they can be pretty fast. So the knights attack them and defeat them, and they go back to Grand Harbor, and of course, they go back uh, rather unhappily through the doors of the Palace of the Inquisition. <clears throat> the case is more serious now because you know, they, they've gone back to it. The original reconversion to Christianity wasn't real. They went back to the Darul Islam. <clears throat> so the Inquisitor Fabio Chigi writes to Rome, to the Pope's office for instructions. <clears throat> ah, they're interrogated, they're tortured. And Murad says he only went to Tripoli to collect some of his belongings. He'd certainly not trampled on the rosary. He was still a Christian. But the Inquisition managed to get some witnesses. We saw him praying, we saw him doing these Muslim things. He was real. Rajab, the same story. I just wanted to go back home to Paros with a gift of money for my parents. So I went to Tripoli to collect my pay and I was going to give it to my mum and my dad. I didn't want to go corsairing, but the Pasha forced me to do this. And during the fight with the knights, he'd not fought, but he'd gone below, hoping the nice Christians would save him. <clears throat> but again, the court produces witnesses against him and he's tortured, he finally confesses. And in the account which Gambin transcribes, it's in Italian, but Gambin's translated the whole thing. Uh, he says, the truth is that I believed to save my soul if I had died as a Muslim. That's it, he was sincere. So the letter comes back from Rome. For Murad, the only chance is, it's clear that he didn't know that he was with other converts to Islam, but it was obvious that he did. So Rome is very clear, the inquisitor, has to appoint a lawyer for Murad in case something new comes up, but it doesn't. So it's the death penalty is given as a sentence for both of them. So there's an image of two men in their San Benitos, uh, looking a bit miserable. Uh, once you'd spent your time in your San Benito or you'd been executed, it would be hung in your local parish church to remind uh, others uh, to avoid a similar mistake. So the sentence comes down 7th of July, 1639. <clears throat> the Inquisitor sends a Greek-speaking priest, Catholic priest, to visit them. And he says, you know the deal. If you repent formally and return to Christianity, you'll be strangled before they burn you. And Murad and Recep reflect on this and actually accept. They accept the sacrament which you could say is probably the appropriate Muslim thing to do because the alternative is a kind of suicide. In any way, this is what the records indicate. 10th of July, the sentences are announced in public in Vittoriosa. And in the 11th of July, they go to the stake. Uh, the faggots of wood are there, but they're strangled by a representative of the knights. The priests wouldn't do the actual execution. <coughs> And then they were burnt ritually in front of a large crowd. And when the news reached Pope Orban, 
he said he received it con sommo piacere, with great happiness. So from his point of view, a happy ending. And there you have uh, Gambin's book, um, which I've taken most of this stuff about the two Greeks from. Two death sentences by the Inquisition Tribunal of Malta, 1639. And you can see you know, the asymmetry, which Gambin is very clear about. The Pasha welcomes them back, accepts their story, uh, and rewards them. The Inquisition does the exact opposite. So Gambin writes this, reflecting on their stories. They reacted against the civilization that oppressed them by switching allegiance to Islam and fighting wholeheartedly against their former colleagues. They did so because they found a new lease of life under Muslim society. In the latter, though not without difficulties, they could express their talents and were appreciated and valued for what they were and for what they were capable of doing. They were also offered the chance for social advancement irrespective of their humble origins and background, something that in their case was practically impossible in Christendom. So, just to wind up these little stories of heroism, their misadventures, uh, what do we learn from that very different age? Well, firstly, we can see that you know, even simple, illiterate people from an out-of-the-way place, a tiny little orthodox corner of the sultan's well-protected domains, uh, were capable of heroism uh, and of strength of character in their escapes, their venturesomeness, their initiative, their intelligence, even though they were just kind of simple sailors, illiterate people. Secondly, we've seen the gigantic importance of these renegades, so forth, the converts, uh, to the Ottoman state, which was, if not entirely supported by them, nonetheless was uh, massively reinforced by them and had no hesitation, whatever their background, in promoting them to the highest office, something impossible in feudal and aristocratic Europe, really until the 19th century. Thirdly, you can see that people even if they knew not much about Islam in Europe, recognized its seductive and dangerous appeal, a kind of vertigo. If you look at the other Inquisition records which are dealing with people like the guy in Catalonia who was the last ever to be killed by the Inquisition, you tend to see a pattern, heretical doubts about the Trinity, about the atonement, about original sin, about the incarnation, and often about priestly celibacy as well. One of the things that you find that the Inquisition in Malta was most uh, tough on was priests who had seduced women in the confessional, and they would be very severely punished, unlike nowadays, which according to the kind of Cardinal McCarrick culture, they just get moved to another parish and the woman's told to be silent, and there's organizations for women who's uh, children were the result of liaisons with priests and it's a whole thing but back then they were very strict on it and this to a lot of people seemed merciless and unrealistic and fourthly uh, the meritocratic nature of Ottoman Mediterranean society people could go up like a rocket if they were talented and this goes to some way to explaining the longevity of the Ottoman state British Empire really lasted for 100 years max. The Ottoman Empire lasted since 1280 until 1925, which is not bad, and governing an enormously diverse realm, different religions, different denominations, different languages that somehow were all incorporated into the Sultan's well-protected domains not the kind of system which could be exactly replicated today, no doubt, uh, but nonetheless one uh, that proved its worth and was very attractive uh, to people like Cosantino, a.k.a. Recep Rahmatullahi Ali. So that's the end of the story. Sorry not to give you a happy ending, but inshallah, Rahmatullahi Wasi'ah.